Listen, girl, you can't be all there in the background. <laughs> scrolling. <laughs> all right. So we're live. We yes, I can. Together. Go in there. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. We're so excited to have you. This is the fourth postcast we're do we've done where we allow the listeners to ask their questions. And so I'm Elaine um, from the podcast. I'm Sarah. Hi. And then I'm going to let Deborah and Tori introduce themselves. I'm Deborah Granick. And I'm Tori Stewart. And so you guys learned about Deborah. I'm just going to do Deb, Deborah on the uh, podcast this week. And so I'm sure you guys have questions, but I want to get started with um, you guys were just in LA for the um, Film Independent Spirit Awards. Could you talk about that and what that experience was like? We actually had fun, you know, and I don't, I don't, I don't think we thought that was a given. And I think that. Um, Film independent, you know, I guess now from being in festivals, from traveling with this film in festivals, it's not lost on me or Tori, you know, or anyone that goes, how much work goes into anything. And this was like a really huge festival in that sense, like just the power of all those people being assembled for, for a very, not a unified reason, but we do have some intense things in common, even though that tent was huge. And that's already a feeling of community. And I, I, I valued that. I think, I, I feel like, um, that I feel like we've gone through lots of iterations of what the word independent means, and I, I don't think we're—I don't think we know what that is still. And I, I don't mean to be fussy about it, but I just mean, you know, financial independence can be defined many, many, many ways. So I don't think that's what—I um, don't think that's what binds that the people in that tent as much as um, really hoping for a lot of diversity in what films get made and shown and ingested and enjoyed in America in any given year, right? You know, the assurance of some kind, it's like, it's like a biodiversity campaign, campaign, you know? And, um, but then when you add humor, like, I, I really liked the, uh, the, the hosts were funny. And I, I, I just liked that I was in a public event, um, that it wasn't very stuffy, that people, there wasn't, um, there is a little bit of red carpet action and stuff like that, but also there's people in really normal clothing and with really normal, um, bodies and a really lower amount of plastic surgery and so like I'm already these are that's good things that's good things because our the you know entertainment industry is huge and this is a sector of people who are wondering whether it can stay on on a a grounded you know real people level and I I like that I liked I liked that that existed and I um, I feel like a lot of the effort behind it is very soulful I feel like the people that run Film, film independent and on the East Coast, you know, IFP, I feel like they are investing and in putting a huge amount of their life effort into cultivating this community and, and making sure that we have some feeling yeah. of, 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 the, of the promise of diversity. Totally. Have you guys both seen Citizen Four? I have, we both have, yes, yes. What did you all think of it? I thought it was hugely like timely relevant I mean it scared it scared I mean I would it, would, it hung on me days and days um, and I felt like no matter what you know the, all the all the sort of circumstances that that you know clamped onto that film you know the, the idea of a single location sort of like the one you're in now you know the idea of, of the hotel room all those limitations, working under duress and under the stresses and secrecy, you know, I couldn't separate the film from the achievement either. You know, I couldn't separate the sort of the finished product from the courage and achievement of doing something that was off limits. So I, I plot it really on the journalism level, on the on the on the ex, on the expose, on the investigation. Um, and that trumped everything else, you know, in terms of any other concerns I might have, <laughs> or not, you know, questions about filmmaking or whatever. Um, and I was also completely blown away by um, Last Days in Vietnam. You know, I thought uh, it was a really hard choice about, you know, what documentary to sort of be um, 
so excited about this year. I, I felt like that one, um, and that. But what that when that day came, when that absolute day of reckoning came, I had to say, okay, Citizen Four is right now, right here. We've got to know about this. This word's got to get out. This film has to be hopefully seen. And and Last Days of Vietnam, you know, it relates to now in so many important ways. And it's a reminder of, of uh, really good, really good actions by good people, which we need all the time to review. But it didn't feel quite as urgent as what was going on in Hong Kong. But we did have a weird, we had a queer experience off of that. Sure. A lot of people asked us the spirits what, what it was like to film in Hong Kong. <laughs> because they thought you were Laura. Yeah, I'm. I'm two feet shorter. She. She was right behind us. She's so. She's really tall, and she had really substantial, amazing power boots on. She looked kind of like a female superhero. I saw and her that. hair is like even like darker and silkier. And it was very weird because, uh, and one guy went really far about sort of telling us all the reasons he liked the film, and, and up until a certain point, it didn't. We didn't realize it wasn't the, our film. <laughs> and so. Uh, so we're, we're taking this in because he was like speaking in these really concrete, I mean not concrete, these substantial general statements about like how a film contributes to awareness, understanding, and all this stuff. And we're like, oh wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's like, and I didn't know what point to stop him to tell him because I knew he, you know he would feel awkward maybe. I have a I have a question as far about the festival circuit and with you know with most with many of your films, but um, is there a point where you're just kind of like I'm done? Uh, I'm done like showing this. I just want to go back and like work on something else now. Like I'm like I'm ready to just like get back to work instead of spending every weekend traveling, going to a different festival. Do you experience that? And do you ever like decline going to festivals? I just talk about that a little bit. Oh yes, yes, yes. I mean, you know, you decline with a heavy heart. I mean, you know, Tori and I have split some of them. We've gone to some different ones. We we've, we've shed tears over ones that we wanted to go to and. It didn't feel like it was the right time for reasons of other work, and then the, and then there's that scary empty feeling of going to festivals, riding it a long time, but feeling like you don't have a new you know, I don't know. There's lots of hideous metaphors and wonderful you know, but like a bun in the oven, whatever it is, you know, it's like you know you you have an empty feeling that you're showing something and it's still meaningful to show it, and yet you you're starting to feel this anxiousness about, um, well. What next? You know, you don't want to, no one, yeah, no one is not, I, I, let me put it this way, I, I think most filmmakers will start to face a conflict about time spent exhibiting something versus starting something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and sometimes it's a really pleasant conflict, like it's a, it's an embarrassment of riches, sometimes those invitations are, and, and what can be very high making and, and wonderful and nutritious, right, is like when you learn something from a festival. Mm -hmm. Like when Obviously, festival is not just about exhibiting your own film. It's also about seeing other people's films. So sometimes, like being invited to be on a jury, sometimes can be very nutritious. Like you're just ingesting a lot of films that you would not necessarily be able to make the time to see in your in your ordinary life. Certain discussions are really um, eye-opening, and they help they help move it along. You know, your own thinking. But we're in the throes of that. We're in the throes of saying like, okay. You know, we're 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 going up to Salem, Massachusetts this weekend. Um, but that, you know, the traveling must stop. Yeah, I have actually. Uh, there's a question here from um, uh, who was it from? They asked um, why you haven't made. I don't think this is supposed to be. Oh, Diane Bell says, um, why haven't you made another narrative film since Winter's Bone? Um, uh, but I did, it is interesting because I did read today that you were not that it came out today, but that you were um, there's talk of you doing Rule of the Bone, an adaptation, which is like the book I have with me right now. But um, yeah, her question, <laughs> her question was why haven't you made another narrative since Winter's Bone? Well, um, I think you know there's a lot of there are a lot of things that feed into that um, reality. One I would say is you do end up sort of making films, you, know, you write scripts and you sort of go deep into them, you might even film tests for them, 
and they don't always prove to be something that either on our side that we want to actually then that we feel it was ready or, or strong enough to make into a film um, and then there are always there's a couple projects that get past you that you read and for some reason they're not going to work out or they're close they're interesting they're kind of interesting and yet I don't feel like I'm the right person to do them you know my own my own assessment of myself like um, so and the documentary uh, became a really pleasurable activity and it was very easy to realize to like just not really feel the pinch of not making so, so sort of not being involved in an active narrative you know I think we started enjoying ourselves maybe too much <laughs> Um, and it was it felt very fulfilling. We had a cast that we really liked working with. We knew where to film. We knew who to film with. So it was like very very doable, and that was its own big pleasure: doability, feasibility, um, not asking lots of different entities for permission. You know, I'm, I'm not going to slag off, but you know, not being involved in such a complicated process. You know. The litigious qualities of like making a film just on the union contract alone, just on that level, there's a lot of uh, a lot of time and psychic energy spent with small battles before you can get to the creative process. And people are obviously there's a team together to help plow that, you know. But I would say so. There's no there's no real reason. There's no there's no really definitive one single reason, you know. Um, except that I am someone that maybe puts a lot of pots on the stove and then loves to just stir them for like a decade, <laughs> which is, you know, obviously something that, you know, in private time, it's not fucking fun. Excuse me. It's not funny. You know, it's not funny. It, it causes me a lot of, you know, internal suffering sometimes, but um, it's not for lack of, of desire or generating ideas. It's really, um, I think, and maybe now it's coming, you know, maybe, I don't know, what's the incredible feminist novelist that said it's like shitting a pumpkin, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> We're having a reaction because we just had to censor a lot of language for, like, PBS. And now we're having, like, now I notice I'm, like, like I have a lot of, like, uh, compulsions to, like, swear and stuff. Yeah. That's not that. against, we're so happy. In fact... We're so happy to be bleeping those things because it's in service to something that means a lot to us. But I'm just saying, it's causing a tick. <laughs> Tori, how did you meet Deborah? How did you start working? Was Stray Dog the first project you guys worked on together? No, I was an assistant editor on Winner's Bone. Um, so that was how I, I met Deborah. Um, and then we continued working together on some DVD extras for Winner's Bone that sort of cauliflowered into many like mini docs um, and that was sort of how I was present for like the first filming of, of Ron because we interviewed him for a different project called Hillbilly Up which was a really sort of loose exploration of the of the word hillbilly and we were back in the region interviewing a lot of the musicians who would participated in Winner's Bone and also Ron and, and some of his friends so that was sort of, you know, we met Alicia for the first time there and he told us about the motorcycle ride to the Vietnam Wall. People came out singing and <laughs> like wielding their guitars and the dogs were all around. So that was a real, um, it was a formative moment in the, in the Stray Dog project because a lot of the elements were front and center on that particular day. And then we They were strumming, we're going to lure you back. <laughs> <laughs> I, I we just got an audience question, but I just wanna I wanna go off what you said a little bit. What what makes it what makes you guys work so well together? Like, what are your personalities? How do they work together? And that you guys are continuing to work together. Like, what's that collaboration like? <laughs> we haven't been asked that before. I know that's interesting. I mean, I'd say humor is a lot of it. Just because I mean, when you're working on a project like Stray Dog, where you have so many hours of footage, and sometimes you feel like you're really in this like murky world of like where's the story is this compelling is anyone ever going to you know think this is worth watching I mean it means a lot when you're sitting next to someone who's like chortling at the same time or like erupting in laughter at the same I mean that's something that you can you know it's like watching a film with an audience for a first time and really like feeling the room but in in miniature I think that's that's really important you can kind of 
feel if you're on the same wavelength with someone. Um, yeah, I mean, that part of it. it can't be undervalued, and that's um, something, you know, that doesn't come every day in filmmaking, right? Because some, t some days in filmmaking are extremely painful on the contractual business side, um, permissions, money, all, all that that can really choke us. But these days at Tori, you know, it's like in some ways you live, I, I live for these days where I'm actually loving my work. I'm sitting next to this colleague who's really talented. She's just cut something. We watched it. We had a similar response. And I'm, I'm loving and, 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 and I'm having um, really affectionate feelings for the subjects. You know, I'm, I'm um, it's almost like it's like replaying positive emotions. It's weird. It's, there's got to be some neurochemistry in there, where you're looking at these guys that you like, or a mixed group, or dogs, or whoever it is, and you're actually watching them repeatedly, and your affection seems to be growing to the point where you're like going at dinner. You're repeating things they said. You're hearing them at night. You're starting to like wonder if you could get away with imitating them during the day. <laughs> you know, there's it's it's getting to be. Talk about being under the skin, right? There's a part of filmmaking that starts to be literally, uh, you know, infusing you on a level that's getting seriously emotional. It's not just intellectual; it's emotional, and um, but it's also sort of the sources of your joy too, you know. And and um, so that's I think that's a big part of it. I think I think. Um, I think it's fair to say that you and I share a lot of the same worldly concerns. Yeah. You know, if Tori reads a GMO article or something, you know, some hideous big ag, big pharma, big something that's going to get our blood to boil, she can be sure that my blood will boil probably at the same Kelvin temperature that hers is, you know. Um, I don't know if Kelvin's free. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, the very high, high temperature. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so, uh, but that also comes to, like issues of compassion. We 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 find ourselves similarly touched by the same um, worldly concerns in, in, in other people's lives, or the or the the um, or pondering some of the same things. So I think both, you know, on the curiosity level, the empathy level, we just sync up a lot. Yeah. With what with what subject matters grab us by the throat and choke us. Awesome. Yeah. And extending even to style. I would say, yeah. as far as maintaining an interest in narrative and, and doc and how they cross-pollinate. That and getting all excited when we see a, a doc filmmaker take some risks with, like, you know, something like she and I can get our rocks off on seeing someone do something with, like, what we call erratic intertitles. Like, decide to have two <laughs> and not 12. You know what I'm saying? Like, decide to have, uh, you know, we, we love something like that. Like, we're like, oh, my God, what balls? You know, normally you would say that if you have one inner title, you have to have four more. And so we, we after a screening like that, we'll come out and say, like, God, that was audacious. That was cool that they did that. Let's try that ourselves. Or let's let let's let's have that embolden us to do to do such a thing. So awesome. I would say also strengthening, right? We like you know. If she's having a doubt, I might say, why not? Let's try it. It costs us nothing to try it. And she'll say the same thing. Like, it's worth a try. Especially in the privacy of your own editing room. Absolutely, awesome. Um, we have a question from Maddie Dennis Yates. Um, in your narrative work, do you find that the final product varies greatly from the original script because of your interactions with people, uh, particularly non-actors, and the environment in the course of filming? Yes, I do feel that um, the minute there are non-actors involved or the filming of something that's going to be taking place as a real event, and we will be shooting it in a what you know I use this term loosely, but a documentary style, meaning we're not stopping the event. So if it's a grocery store that's in full swing, we are maybe filming in there, and we're not asking the grocery store to shut it down. So therefore, um, there may be vagaries. I might see something out of my peripheral vision, and then say. Could this person step into to the actress's line and be a customer? Like we might pick up a couple extra extras. We might, um, if it's a real life, if it's a person who's doing a real job, they may they may uh, say the take differently. They may issue the, their lines differently every single time, and the actor might try to sync up with that. But nonetheless, each take will be different. So 
the minute there are real life elements that are not controlled ex exclusively by the production, I would say uh, the work starts to have variations and and incoming incoming additions, sort of as as the film is is, is being shot. Very cool. Um, we have one more question, which is, um, Deborah, you're the granddaughter of broadcast pioneer Theodore Granick, who is the founder moderator of Radio TV's panel discussion, The American Forum of the Air. How did that influence you? How did he influence you? Uh, well, I, um, when my dad died uh, was three years ago, I um, was helping my brother clean out my dad's house, and we came upon a lot of boxes from Theodore, and um, boxes of scripts, and it was a very intense and um, I had a lot of goosebumps that weekend because I it was very interesting me, for me to find out some of the scripts that he had been involved with. He had a lot of aspirations to do narrative work outside of the broadcast like uh, world and uh, in some investigation kind of social investigation pieces, and it was very um, yeah it was it was it was it was it was not that it was uncanny it was all, it was all new information for me, and it was that one moment where like oh god you know oh do we ever get just five minutes to speak to our dead you know like I would just love to talk to him for uh, I probably need more than five minutes but it was that feeling like I wish I had um, known him I was really young when he uh, died so um, seeing seeing photographs of some of the things that he was involved with were interesting uh, of course very interesting you know influence how do we ever know what part of our family's uh, you know chromosomal slash neurochemical stew gets transmitted you know you know it didn't influence me going into this work, but now I feel like there maybe there is something to it. I just don't know how to access it, you know. If someone doesn't somehow get me a really highly functioning Ouija board, you know. <laughs> but I'm interested, and I'm interested in who who this person is that even knows of Ted Granick, you know. I am. It's it's on the internet, I think. Oh. <laughs> All right, tell the Luddite. <laughs> Speaking, speaking of family, you mentioned in the interview your daughter, because you said your daughter calls you Slogo, but we didn't actually talk about your family. How do you balance motherhood? Is that your only child, and how do you balance that with work and, and everything else you're doing? Um, Hannah is my only child, though, of course, you know, at some points I wish I had like 10 or 15 more. You know, no, no. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to have to decide like middle school for more kids. I would freak out. But like, I would lose my. But um, I do. I really do love being able to be connected to people in different parts of the of their developmental process. And Tori and I actually uh, find it meaningful to stay connected to um, a, a young man that played in Winter's Bone. He was the. He played a. a the sibling of Reed Dolly of, of Jennifer Lawrence. He lives in Missouri, and um, now we've seen him basically every year of his teen, right? I mean, we've seen him every year since Winter's Bone. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And, you know, I it's it adds a lot to my existence to try to uh, get firsthand details about what it's like to, like to navigate life at different stages, because you can only remember a fraction of your own experience because you're so busy living it, right? So then the observer in me likes to be able to see that. So um, so the wish is there, you know, if you could balance, if one could balance time spent working, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at people that, that do have a gaggle of children. Blows It just blows me into bits of, of awe. Um, I do think... It's hard. You you just don't want to be cheating on your kid. You know, it's like it's it's it's, it's, it's it can be it can be truly awkward. It can be like, um, and other times it's it's really rewarding. They say the darndest things. You know, <laughs> um, they 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 want to be friends with your colleagues. You know, and that's another incredible bond. Tori's been incredibly generous and mentorish towards my daughter, so that's like lucky thing. I mean, and and it doesn't always happen, but I'm just saying. So, uh, it's a balance. I I mean. 
there's a big chain of uh, um, emails that have been going on the West Coast. Uh, filmmakers, I think filmmakers that are heavily involved in television, you know, very prominent, today's prominent women filmmakers created a chain of emails coming out of that USC study about um, the rate at which women produce work and certain st statistical inequalities that exist in the industry and a big thread, a big thread in that chain is uh, balancing um, parenting and, and, and film work and, and really astute comments were made like what about making the hours normal? Why does it have to be shot in 18 hour increments? What about a European model where you could actually be a functional good parent and also make your films? You know, so there were some really tactical, astute things brought up that were that were substantial, not just not just personal experience, but like, what if? How could we do this? That kind of stuff. So maybe uh, someone could even publish like the best, cherry pick the best emails out of that chain, um, or maybe um, maybe the USC the, the USC researchers are great women for your she does. <laughs> <laughs> she, she could tell you yeah. the real shit on the statistical level and on the on the. Uh, on the emo, she could pick some anonymous quotes from some of the yeah. responders. That would be good, actually. That's a good yeah. idea. I like that. Sarah, did you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, this is a question that I've had. When you are, when you are filming either uh, like a narrative or a documentary, and you kind of come up against you know, someone saying, no, you can't shoot here, or someone saying, don't shoot me at all, or some of these like roadblocks, I feel like you can either maybe like numb yourself and kind of be a little brave and go for it. But I was wondering how you approach that and how you handle, you know, some of these roadblocks when you're filming um, and what kind of mindset you're in when you just kind of want to get this. This is your piece of art, so you, you've got to make sure it happens. Mm. That's a hard. It's a hard. It's a great question, and it's hard. It, it, there's, you know, it's it's very case by case, right? Because I mean, yeah. I mean, it really matters whether people are feeling violated and whether they are self-disclosing that they operate at a very angry threshold. You know, then you really have to listen because you are now um, you are provoking someone. You're and provoking. You're not going to get anything. And you're good. Right, right. no. I think it's really hard to want to feel like brave and not wuss out and you know retreat from something that you think is really important, but. You also have to stay aware of the fact that if you're pushing too hard, whatever you're getting is not going to work well anyway, yeah. um, and could be jeopardizing, you know, to to other material. And I think it's um, straightforward. when it's a subject that you become close to, you can trust that they are going to put their, their, their that that roadblock will be well earned. You know, it's going to be they're saying I can't go any further on this, or I need a break, or I need to back off this. You know, you know, and that one you want to be that person ethically, right? Like you want to be the person that can hear your subject say, you know, this, this, is, this is a boundary I, I, need, to, I, I need you to respect. I want, and, and, and then it's on me to do that, right? It's on me. I think, um, I think uh, the ask, you know, I think feeling, feeling okay, that it's okay to ask and get refused, thick skin, right? Thick skin is a huge part of this. Um, being able to hear a no and, and, and not be and not feel so so defeated by it. Speaking of thick skin, um, how often do you, you know, concept, produce, write a pilot, whatever it may be for something for it never to see the screen? So I had read about um, is it true that you were developing something about Pippi Longstocking, or is that just a rumor? And then the also the rule of the bone, like how often does that happen where there's sort of this, you know, someone approaches you, you maybe write a pilot and it doesn't happen and, and how, do you get paid for those? Like how, how does that all work? Well, all right, so just a clarification, always important to put out the Pippi clarification. Pippi was um, something I used as an example of some, a film like that, that I, I had said very real, very, very genuinely that I would like to someday make a kid, uh, you know, a film for younger audience. Uh, I would enjoy that. The innocence of that is, you know, I would like to, um, and I gave an example, and, they, and we were talking about female, female role models, and I gave the example that Pippi was meaningful to me and that I was enjoying reading Pippi to my daughter, and somehow that really got construed. I think I used the future tense, like, gosh, if, you know, someday, all things being equal, I'd love to do another Pippi, you know, or something like Pippi, and it got to be, like, to the point where Astrid, Astrid Lindgren's estate 
called us <laughs> and said, Pippi is not on the market right now. Pippi is being, the last Pippi was not something that we really liked. Pippi's been, you know, shredded and overused right now. We're pulling Pippi so she can recover. And anyway, so it was... <laughs> That's so, social media for you. Someone I still really, I love, I love her as a female, um, as a character that could mean something to girls, and and especially because she was early in the process of of that, you know, of, of, she was an early arriver. Um, but uh, so yeah, so so Ixnay on the Pippi. There's no Pippi. <laughs> um, and with uh, a pilot, the, the pilot that I did really have my heart sort of hooked on was written by a very talented screenwriter named Nikki Paluga. And so she's really a good person to ask this question to, just sort of what is it like to invest a really a lot of drafts, a lot of craft, a lot of exquisite writing, really honing it, honing it, listening to the feedback, doing the feedback, and still, uh, you know, not having it sort of viewed to be not somehow worthy when, you know, uh, or saleable or marketable, whatever, whatever, or, or there's too much of it, or it has too many poor people in it, or we're not interested in poor people, or 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 it's not exploitative enough of poor people, you know, whatever this, whatever the ultimate real feeling is, um, she weathered that. I was I was really rooting for her project because I, I I really enjoyed the world she was creating and thought she was a razor sharp writer, um, but I didn't have that full blown. What's it called? Feeling of like, oh, it was a project that I didn't have. I didn't have to take that that crush, uh, you know, full tilt. Um, Rule the Bone is a project that no, very few people can say we can't do. Russell's a very supportive. He's an author, one of these dream authors, who's um, got a very elastic and and open-hearted approach to seeing something go from book to screen. So it's only been a really big pleasure to work with him, and that's still we're still. We're still going on that. That as you know, the only thing that will stop us if somehow we can't do justice to sort of what we think uh, the story holds. But it's an interesting project, and uh, and there have been a couple other projects that we're really deep into a lot of drafts on. Um, so so far, there haven't been a lot of crushes. There's been stuff we wanted to do that other people could buy us, you know, outbid us for. That's that's always a bummer. Cool. Like, some people have some deep pocketbooks that can, you know, buy things, buy options that you that you, you know that we that we have enjoyed. But right, um, we have a question bitter. about daily. Day, what did you say? I said today we're not feeling bitter. Okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, we have a question about daily habits. Do you guys have um, any type of habits or routines that you do to work together to stay on track or to keep fresh ideas or? Anything like that that you guys like to do, whether it's drinking caffeine or going for walks or whatever it may be. Uh, I'm going to show as an example right here in this ramekin. Can you can you see? The, do you know what this is? Chocolate. Chocolate's a habit. Eighty percent chocolate. We keep a ramekin like this at on our desk. I mean, I think that um, Deborah and I are both heavily caffeine dependent, such that I think we can usually tell at this point when one of us has either not had enough or has had a little too much and can sort of accommodate. It's like, oh, did, you know, I was going to make another cup. Like, do you need another cup? Or, you know, oh, oh, you think you're going to have another cup? Maybe not. Maybe let's wait till. <laughs> I mean, there's like a chemical balance of that. But, no, yeah. I'd say. And we both pout when we get to, like, a place not dissing any region, but when we get to, like, a, 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 a low coffee area. One of us is more flexible, and one of us gets really pouty. I, I, I get very... Tori, you could swing with some of Oh, yeah, I could drink some gas station coffee. Yeah. Gas station coffee and instant coffee will make me pouty, so don't worry. And I'm from West Virginia, so I'm, it's, a, <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, routines, um, sometimes we have, uh, you know, sometimes... Lunch? Yeah, we, 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 we try to eat lunch, and um, since our other, our other office mate... Uh, now dwells on the West Coast. Some of our lunch content has declined. She was the person that brought in a lot of stuff from the um, the green world, you know. Uh, so we we, <laughs> we do a lot of stuff on bread. That's that's the common thread. Um, and then I think we also try to um, 
talk each other down when one of us has had a bad occurrence of reading the headline that's truly upsetting, like devastating. We try to talk each other down. Yeah, I mean, I think that's become a little bit of a routine. Yeah, I think Can one you or the other. An will. example. Um, for me, it's usually big ag or big pharma, and for you, it's ISIS or um, mass killings. Yeah, M misreporting of things. I mean, misreporting can get uh, real bees in our bonnets about various events, but usually it's a cartoonish sort of like bursting out of the elevator and like, oh, did you read this or this or this? I mean, I always have like, a, you know, a digital pocket full of incendiary material, and so sometimes I'm really just like, can't keep it in. I have to let it all out after like a subway ride where I've just spent the whole time wanting to like turn to my neighbor and be like, have you read, like, did you read this? And then Deborah bears the brunt of that when I get in. So. Yeah, and now the world is so shaky and scary. You know, we're having such a rough time globally. I mean, such a hugely rough time. That sounds so glib. But but prior to that, it, it was that two years of just every day new headlines about crimes against, really crimes against poor people. You know, from wage theft to just, it, it, it didn't stop. It didn't stop every single day. But we would sit there, and, and it was like, then, then there was this devastating kind of feeling of, of inurement, like, oh, my God, it, can it get any worse? So we try to get ourselves out of this hole daily. We crawl out of this hole so we can begin working. <laughs> I'd say also, maybe just to sort of wrap up, but in, yeah. encouraging, um, really supporting, like, going out to see other yes, films, yes. like, acknowledging that that's a really critical part of the work day and that it's okay for that to fall within the, like, 9 to 5 region. Like, if we hear of a screening happening at... MoMA at like 2.30 in the afternoon, we will like encourage each other to take Twice the a break. year. <laughs> yeah. Twice a year. Talk Two is more. cheap, Tori. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm hoping. I'm yeah. like putting yeah. this out so we yeah. can do yeah. it more. But, no, it's um, a, I mean, oh. it is a positive thing. To have a meaningful discussion and to learn something and enjoy something is, is, is if, this is your, if this is your field, it's like reading another article. You know, it's, it's, it's reading the text, right? All these seminars would say to see another person's film is reading the text and that that's that it's you need a you need a you need a close colleague to be able to validate that awesome um, unless Sarah has any more questions we will end on the final question which is um, any final advice for from Deborah for um, screenwriters or directors and then from Tori from an editing standpoint producing standpoint um, thanks a tip that you've learned over the years maybe a mistake you've made and and how you could encourage people to do it differently. Want to go first? No. Okay. Um, a tip for, uh, a t was it a tip for directing and narratives, or I, I didn't. It's get either. The call. Okay. Um, oh, I mean, you know, the biggest tip. I mean, you've 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 chosen to highlight this in the discussion today, but the biggest tip is you know, having a colleague that you pollinate with and and get lots of sparks. I mean that's a huge tip. I mean I don't you know I don't know except for some of the most exquisite art films, I don't know how people I can't imagine this work without that dialectic with another another brain that that enjoys the process of trying to tell stories through motion through moving images, you know, and so that's that's a major tip. Um just coming from the you know the near and dear, um, and I would say uh, starting out if it's just about starting out, picking something that you can self green light, picking something that would not need uh, truly large sums of money. I mean, this is so obvious. You know, it, it, I mean, we we live in this discussion all the time, don't we? You know, just in terms of amongst ourselves and, and, and the organizations that support us, but uh, I can't, I can't, I can't underestimate that because it's, uh, that's the difference between just going somewhere and starting to film. Yeah. Versus asking lots and lots of people, do you think this idea is worthy? No. Um, yeah. I mean, I'd say on the editing front, like, one of the things that's great about editing is you can learn different parts of the craft through so many different types of material, you know, so cutting a commercial can be instructive, cutting a music video is constructive, cutting a narrative, cutting a doc, I mean, you 
build up that skill set doing a lot of different things. So it's, it's sort of liberating and that you don't, you can just say yes to a lot of what crosses your path because you know in some way it's going to be helpful, you know, more often than not, say 99% of the time. Um, and then I think like in, in general, people who are inclined towards editing are usually this way, you know, personality wise anyway, but um, I think just making sure to stay open to feedback always um, during the editing process and that it's really, really valuable to have uh, a community, a supportive community that you can turn to, you know, for feedback screenings or just when you're really feeling like, oh my God, I've been in this dark little cave. And like I was saying before, like you, the doubt sets in and you wonder like, am I just a crazy person like laughing at this material that I think is funny? Like, you know, or can I get some feedback from other people who I trust and who will you know, like talk me down and be like, okay, this is working, this isn't, or yes, we see something too. So I think it's really important to stay open to that and not A, feel alone, or B, feel like you are the only one who like truly has the, the insight into what you're working on. Awesome. I may have lied because we just got another question and I do want you guys to answer it. So do you have time for another question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, this is from Trisha Falk. She says, as women at the helm of projects, how do you work with different personalities? I sometimes find myself being overly apologetic when I realize in retrospect, retrospect that I don't need to be. Uh, the uh, socialized, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, you know, some of us, I don't know how, you know, how old or young this person is, but um, some socialization you could spend a lot, again, you could spend a lot of psychic energy trying to rid yourself of it. I, in my lifetime, I don't think I will be able to rid myself of a lot of the socialization that makes me sometimes, uh, that works in my detriment, which makes me too relational. You know, I, over, I veer towards probably losing my boundaries and over-empathizing, you know, being overly concerned, um, you know, my producing partner on the narratives, uh, who's our, our colleague, Ann Rosalini, I mean, she would, I can speak frankly with her. I can say, you know, I know it's inappropriate for me to be worrying about whether the crew is having a good enough lunch because I'm supposed to be working only on did that scene work? Uh, and that's a part of my brain that's really hard for me to, to turn off. You know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's there saying, apologizing, you know, Yeah, it's, 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 it's that it's striking that balance between acknowledging when you would like to communicate to someone that you, you value their ideas and that if you stepped on them in some way or if you um, did something that you genuinely feel regret, of course, apologies are, 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 are in order. Um, but living, what I don't like is when I live with a sort of apologetic, sort of hover, like a hovering sense of that I'm apologizing for a whole host of things that... Uh, many people can actually just let fly and just let roll off, you know. Um, so I would say um, I, I get frustrated with that side of myself that I would say is very conventionally female so, you know, socialized from in a, in a kind of long-running female way. Um, and then it takes me just being around some people that don't that have like stronger boundaries, and I and I and I find out that it's it's really good. There is like cognitive behavioral remediation, you know. Like I can start to like amend myself, and be much more to the point, much more focused on the work that I'm supposed to be doing, not worrying so much about how other people are feeling at all times. Awesome, Tori. Did you want to add anything to that? Oh, just that, I mean, I agree with pretty much all of that. I mean, I think a lot of the time you feel like you have to apologize for the space you take up even and just, like, remembering that you're bringing, like, just as much to the table, just as much to the situation. I mean, I'd say, like, I went to an all-girls school until eighth grade. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I felt, like, very empowered as a young person, and now in my, like, current profession, I spend a lot of time in, like, smaller groups of really supportive people, so... I feel you know, lucky to not have to navigate that dynamic too much. I'm more like, you know, negative, self-flagellating dynamic, but I know that that is part of 
the industry, and it's it's really important to continue addressing. Like, we need to strengthen okay. ourselves. Thank you guys so much. Um, next week on the show, we will have uh, Kara Oler, who is the she's a radio documentary maker and filmmaker, and the co-founder of Ziga, which is an interactive storytelling platform and GoPop, which was recently acquired by BuzzFeed. Um, so tune in next week to hear her story. And thank you so much, Deborah and Tori. This was awesome. We really people, appreciate it. People and can be watching out for, people can be watching out for Stray Dog coming through their town yeah. next week. Month, couple, yeah. Few months. <laughs> um, yeah, please check the, the website. Our, our website and Facebook have all the screening dates. The website is straydogthemovie.com. We're going to be in um, Salem, Cleveland, Atlanta. Uh, we just played in Sun Valley. There, there are quite a few dates coming River up. River Run? Yep. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, and we're having a screening. And for local folks in New York, we're having a screening at DCTV next Wednesday. And, and that information is on the website as well. So. Cool. Thank you. It's exciting. Yeah, thanks to everyone for asking questions, too. And Deborah and Tori, if you want to just stay here, I'm going to stop the broadcast, so and we'll all just wrap it up. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your work. <laughs>